Chapter 18 Marooned We slammed the hatch shut and climbed back down to the axial catwalk. They'll be back for us as soon as the gale blows itself out, Hal said. I said nothing. Nadira and Kate were breathing hard, struggling to keep their balance as the Hyperion heaved and trembled. We'd taken her captive only briefly, and now she was free once more, and appeared to be reveling in the storm winds. She's been through worse, I told myself. She spent forty years aloft, pummeled by the sky, and she survived. Ominous shrieks and groans wafted through the ship like the cries of a tortured man. When will the wind die down, do you think? Kate asked. Hal, trying to sound like he was just making polite conversation. Could be an hour. Oh, that's not so bad. Or twelve. Dorje will keep us in sight, but he won't try to dock unless it's safe. If the saga gets wrecked, we're all finished. Is anyone hungry? I think Mrs. Ram packed us some sugared almonds and dried fruit. The ship lurched the port, and Kate staggered against me. We should find somewhere safer to wait this out, I said. What about Grunel's apartments? There are blankets if we get cold. I'd rather not go back there, Kate said with surprising firmness. I looked from her to Hal. What happened? Nothing, Hal said, sounding exasperated. Remember the sheet I threw over Grunel? When Kate and I went in, it fell off and gave her a bit of a fright. It didn't just fall off, Kate objected. My back was turned, and I heard a sound like someone ripping off the sheet. When I looked around, it was on the floor. I felt my scalp prickle. Things move aboard a ship, Hal said, especially in storm conditions. He'll be tap dancing next, said Nadira. Surely there's somewhere else, Kate insisted, preferably without dead people. Had it been left up to me, I would have stayed perched in the crow's nest. It would be viciously cold, but at least there I could see the open sky. I dreaded descending further into the ship's darkness. A somewhere with windows would be good, I said. That way we can save our torches for night, if it comes to that, I added seeing the alarm in Kate's eyes. Why not his engineerium? Nadira said. We can finish searching it while we wait. I'm not sure that's a good idea, I said. There's a lot of heavy equipment in there. I wouldn't want any of that ripping free in the storm and crushing us. It looks pretty well tethered to me, Hal said. Nadira's right. We can put our time to good use and check it thoroughly. Seems Grunel spent most of his time squirreled in there. That's where he'd hide his riches. So far, I've found nothing but the contents of the captain's safe. Petty cash and the crew's wages for three months. That's something, at least, I said. It's not enough to repair even one of my engines. We climbed down the swaying ladder to the keel and worked our way aft, the catwalk pitching beneath us. We entered Grunel's apartment to take as many blankets as we could carry from the linen cupboard. Though we did not go into the actual bedroom, I felt clammy just imagining him sitting on his reclining chair with his hollow cheeks and watchful eyes. I wondered if his sheet was on or off him. Back on the catwalk, we stopped near one of the freshwater tanks and managed to chip away some icicles to suck. We were all very thirsty. But the icicles were so bitterly cold against my lips and tongue, it felt hardly worthwhile. We entered the engineerium and turned off our torches. I gazed up worriedly at Grunel's immense telescope-like machine. Though it vibrated slightly in the bad gusts, it seemed anchored solidly to the floor, like every other piece of equipment in the room. I wouldn't mind a cup of tea, Kate said, and sat down with her back against the crate. Nadira pulled sugared nuts from her rucksack and offered them around. I handed out blankets, studying the girls' faces, wondering how their strength was holding out. Hal had walked off. Against one wall, he'd found a ladder that ran on a track in front of the shelves. I left Kate and Nadira and made my way over to him. He tried a few times to climb the ladder, but it was rolling back and forth too much. Eventually, he gave up with a curse and decided to forage with both feet on the ground. Really, he should have sat down, but... 
I could tell he was in a dangerous mood. He needed to find something big. Beyond the ship's hull, the wind screeched and whistled and thumped, wanting to be let in. I don't think this is going to blow itself out soon, I said. No, he agreed. Would Dorje try to dock at night, I asked. He'd wait till dawn's light. He was infuriatingly calm, and I admired him, even as I tried to quell my own growing fear. If we're here overnight, I said, it's going to get even colder. Hal grunted. And we're out of the wind, at least. I'm worried about the girls. If they start needing oxygen, we'll run out. They can share mine. I don't need it. I went back to Kate and Nadira and told them I was going to make a fire. I needed to be doing something. I broke some crate lids into kindling and arranged them on a piece of sheet metal. Inside the various crates was plenty of shredded paper and packing sawdust. That would catch fire easily enough. You're a good man to have around in a shipwreck, said Nadira. This isn't a shipwreck, Hal said jovially, taking a blanket and settling down beside Kate. We're still skyworthy. All we need to do is keep warm. Now a trick you learn fast enough on Everest is to stay close and conserve body heat. He snuggled up beside Kate and waved for Nadira to come closer. She raised an eyebrow at him. Trust me, Hal said. This is standard mountaineering practice. We stay warm, we stay alive. Nadira chose to sit beside Kate. Hal heaped more blankets around them. Kate smiled and seemed to be enjoying herself. My pulse beat hard and fast in my ears. Come on in, Cruz, Hal said. The more the merrier. Where's the butane torch? I asked. Why? What are you up to? Making a fire. Hal shook his head. Not with the ship pitching like this. Some embers spill and the fire gets out of control. We're as good as sunk. Anyway, you won't get much of a fire going in this thin air. Smoke is all you'll make. I hadn't thought of that. I felt a proper idiot. What we can do, said Hal, is make a brew. What's that? Kate asked. It's what we call making water on Everest. Go find a metal can now, and we'll use the torch to melt some ice for drinking water. I started scouting around for a likely container, one that didn't already contain some vile-looking chemical sludge. Make a brew, I muttered resentfully to myself. That's what we call it on Everest. Of course, Hal would know all about how to survive at high altitude. He was perfect. He was also right. We needed water. At these altitudes, it was very easy to get dehydrated. Sucking snow or ice just wasn't enough. Beyond the large windows, the sun still blazed, bobbing up and down as the ship cavorted through the storm. Near the enormous telescope machine, my eyes swept across the complicated control panel. I wished I knew what all those buttons and gauges meant. Hal might not give a toss, but I certainly did. I had a feeling that this was the machine Grinnell had been laboring over when aloft. From the brass panel, I brushed away some frost and saw a keyhole. I think you should see this, I called out to the others. They threw off their blankets and joined me. The keyhole looked remarkably similar to the one in the doors to the dead zoo and engineerium. Well, isn't this intriguing, said Hal, casting his eye over the machine's bulky lower regions. Big enough for a vault, do you think? You think it's full of money? I asked, surprised. Gold, preferably, remarked Nadira. She was already reaching into her hood to extract her key. Can't see hinges anywhere, Hal commented, shining his light all around the control panel. If there's a door, it's well hidden. Nadira slid the key into the keyhole. By now she had learned all its tricks. She twisted and prodded until the key was fully inserted, then gave a complete turn. All across the machine's surface, lights silently blinked on. I heard a sudden gurgle of water and traced the sound to a pair of broad pipes running from the machine up the wall to a large mounted tank. Should be frozen, I muttered. What's it doing? Hal said, with the utmost suspicion. Light suddenly filled the room as the hanging lamps along the ceiling snapped on. A drill came to life and made us all jump. I rushed over and managed to turn it off. 
there was a sharp crackling sound. Along the baseboards was an electric heater, its coils slowly turning orange as they warmed up. He's got electric hearths, I said. There must have been others placed all around the chamber, for already I could feel a welcome current of milder air moving past my pinched feet. I rushed to the engineerium's door and peered out into the dark catwalk. Nothing's on out there, I called back. Whatever was powering the lamps and heaters was confined to the engineerium. It must be a generator, Kate said. But where's it getting fuel? Hal demanded. Some kind of battery, I suggested. No battery holds its charge for 40 years. This one seems to, Nadira said. I'd done some reading on batteries in my electrics class. Most of those built in the early days were not very efficient, and they tended to give off poisonous fumes. I had a sniff and caught only a faint whiff of mangoes, which I assumed was leaking from the vivarium. Well, we've got light and heat, Hal said, and that's the first bit of welcome news all day. Hal asked me to go and close the door so we didn't lose the heat. I made sure there was a handle and keyhole on the inside, but even so, I felt a bit anxious when it slid shut. I didn't trust Grunel's doors and dreaded the idea of being entombed aboard his dead ship. The heaters were working hard. It was still well below zero, but there is all the difference in the world between minus 60 and minus 20. Once Hal knew the machine wasn't a bank vault, he lost interest. He set about searching the engineerium again. Even as the ship continued to shudder and jolt, I knew we all felt more cheerful now that the room was well lit and warming up. Nadira didn't look so pale. Kate seemed tired, but in good spirits. I was heartened to know we would not be facing the coming night with just our electric torches. Nadira had been exploring the Engineerium, and came to a stop at the phrenology machine with its many spidery arms. Thinking of having a go? Kate asked pleasantly. You know, I think we should both have a go, Nadira said with a smile. What do you say? Since I'm no good at fortune telling, maybe this can help predict our futures. Just for a lark. Nadira was being awfully friendly, but I wondered if there was just a hint of a challenge in her invitation. Certainly, I wouldn't have wanted to put my head in Grunel's contraption, but Kate was never one to back away from anything. Why not? she said brightly, walking over. We have better ways to pass the time, said Hal, sounding annoyed. Cruz, what about that water? I don't imagine this will take long, Kate said. Matt, can you crank it up for us, please? Who's going first? I asked, grasping the handle and turning. After you, said Nadira to Kate. No, no, I insist, said Kate, ushering Nadira toward the machine. The stool must have had some kind of sensor, for the moment Nadira sat, a clockwork ticking emanated from inside the machine. Its many mechanical arms, each tipped with calipers, slowly unfolding, circling Nadira's head. There was something decidedly menacing about them. Stay very still, I said, reading the instructions on the side of the machine. With a sudden jerk, the first set of calibers came down and the two points jerkily adjusted themselves to the width of Nadira's head and slowly began to revolve. It tickles, actually, said Nadira, biting her lips and trying not to giggle. The first set of calipers withdrew. The mechanical spider above her head turned one way, then another, and a second pair of instruments dropped down and gripped another part of Nadira's head. This time she winced as the points tweaked her ear. The calipers lifted away, and now a thick rubber cap descended and covered the top of her skull. Through the rubber I could see odd little knuckles kneading Nadira's head quite firmly. It feels like someone's got their fingers all over me, she said. Are you all right? I asked. It's rather nice. It could be a bit gentler, though. While the rubber cap was massaging her skull, two more pairs of calipers dropped down on either side of her head. For a moment they looked like they were going to veer into her ears, but at the last second they twirled off to one side and began measuring her temples. One arm of the calipers caught in her hair and began twisting it into a knot, tighter and tighter. 
Ow! she cried, pulling away and getting jabbed on the other side. The rubber cap seemed to tighten its grip on her skull, the metal knuckles kneading more furiously than before. I tried to untangle her, but the little prongs were stubborn and surprisingly strong, and I could not stop them from turning and yanking her hair. Nadira struggled to stand, but the rubber cap pushed down hard and kept her locked in her seat. I've had enough, she said. Turn it off. Hal, watching from a distance, just laughed, but I could tell Nadira was alarmed. Kate and I started tugging and pulling the arms of the mechanical spider while trying to pry the cap off her head. It hurts, Nadira cried out. Get it off me. Hal stopped laughing and ran over to lend a hand. None of us really knew what we were doing, but suddenly Nadira came flying off the seat. The mechanical arms jerked to and fro, resentfully, the calipers jabbing the air, searching for their victim. I can't see this catching on in a big way, I said. Are you all right? Nadira was rubbing her head, touching her ears, making sure everything was still there. She turned and kicked the machine. There was a busy clicking sound from somewhere inside, and a ribbon of ticker tape shot out and landed at Kate's feet. She picked it up. It's your personality assessment, she said, eyes flicking over the scroll. Nadira snatched it from Kate's hand and examined it. It looks like you get a score out of 10 in different categories. Vitativeness, 9. What's vitativeness? Love of life and power to resist illness, I believe, said Kate. That's a very good score. Benevolence, 7. Who does better than that, said Hal, amused. Self-esteem, 8. Tune, 10. I never knew I was musical, said Nadira, pleased. Secretiveness, she trailed off. Ten, said Hal, peering over her shoulder. No surprise there. Nadira took a step away and kept reading. Individuality, ten. Cautiousness, three. Combativeness, nine. She looked over and gave me a wink. Well, what did you expect from a pirate's daughter? Hope, eight. Amativeness, what's that? Kate actually blushed. I think it has something to do with your attractiveness to the opposite sex. Ten, said Nadira, smiling modestly. Gosh, said Kate, I'd say you scored awfully well. It's just a silly machine, said Nadira, folding away her piece of paper. Are you going to have your go? Absolutely not, I insisted. That thing's murderous. Kate looked crestfallen. I really did want to see my scores. I suppose Matt's right, said Nadira. What a shame. Load of nonsense, said Hal. Cruz, there's a bucket over there perfect for water. Grudeau's machine is making me thirsty. And me as well, for within its vast metal innards, the contraption made a faint but constant gargle. The bucket Hal pointed out was full of sand. I suppose this is what Grunel had used as a fire extinguisher before he invented his own. I banged out the sand in a solid block. Someone needs to go with you, Hal said as I headed for the door. I'm fine. No one goes alone. Kate, go with him. I'd send Nadira, but with all that amativeness, she and Cruz might get up to some mischief. Hal chuckled at his own joke, but Kate could not have looked less amused. She grabbed her torch from her rucksack and walked over, staring past me. I felt very glum. The engineerium's vault-like door opened easily, and I left it ajar as we ventured out onto the catwalk. After the lighted room, the darkness and cold were even more oppressive. In silence, we walked toward the water tanks. I used the sharp end of my pry bar to chisel at the ice. Kate picked up the pieces and put them in the bucket. All around us, the Hyperion was alive with sounds I did not recognize. I felt as if the storm had awoken the ship and ghostly crew. My hair raised at the sound of an odd clanking. What was that? Kate asked, trying to sound merely interested. Uh, just a loose elevator chain, I said. What about the wheezing noise? Air blowing against an intake vent, I replied. Are you lying to me? As best I can, yes. You don't need to lie to me, she said testily. 
I'm not a child. Fine. I have no idea what these sounds are. That thumping noise? For all I know, it might be the dead marching toward us. The ship heeled over, righted herself sharply, and somewhere a door slammed shut with the force of an explosion. Kate clutched my arm. I clutched back. The wind, I told her. It sounded like it came from Grinnell's apartment. He's just trying to stay fit. She did not laugh. Don't be scared, I said, touching her shoulder. I'd never let any harm come to you. She turned away from me. You're a liar, she said tightly. What do you mean? For a moment she said nothing. I saw you, kissing her. I was glad she had her back to me, for the face I wore must have been the stupidest gate-mouthing thing in the world. But I asked if you were angry with me, and you never said anything. She turned to me, eyes flashing. Of course I saw you kissing her. I was halfway up the ladder. How could I have missed it? I didn't hear you. I'm not surprised. You seem thoroughly engrossed. And what about you and Hal? I said, starting to feel some indignation of my own. The dancing, all the compliments, and cozy little chats. Why not? I could see the way you looked at Nadira even before you kissed her. Uh, she kissed me, actually. Perhaps I should have let Hal kiss me. You wanted him to? He's very appealing. Maybe you should marry him then, I said recklessly. Or has he already proposed? He means to take you for his wife. Take me for his wife? Kate said with a laugh, which I hoped was disdainful. He said that? I nodded miserably. As if I had no say in the matter, she exclaimed. And what would you say? I couldn't stop myself from asking. The ship lurched and groaned around us. I waited for her answer. I'd say no, she said. I started to smile. I have no intention of marrying anyone just now, she added. Least of all a wretch like you. I'm sorry, I said. It's not your fault you're attracted to her. She's very beautiful. I shook my head. It's you I crave. Then why have you been avoiding me? I've just been busy. And you've been so unfriendly. I thought you'd lost interest in me. You're such an idiot. I was just trying to make you jealous. It worked. Her face lit up. Did it? I was never sure. Were you utterly miserable? Utterly. So was I. I took her hand. If my heart were a compass, you'd be north. That, she said, is a very romantic thing to say. But it seems the needle swings a bit to Nadira, too. A little magnetic disturbance, I said. Nothing more. She scored a perfect dead mat. You'd have scored eleven. Anyway, what about you and Hal? I do hope he proposes. Kate! Only so I could say someone's proposed to me. You know the answer's no. Just for now? Just forever. He's a bit of a bully at heart. Old Hal's not so bad, I said, feeling incredibly generous. He's a natural leader, she said. They're all arrogant. They need to be. I was suddenly so happy I put my arms around her and pulled her fur-clad body against mine. I've really missed you, I said. Likewise. It was not the most satisfying kiss. Our faces were numb with cold, our lips chapped, but it did not matter. I was just so glad to have her close and breathe her in. Better than oxygen she was. We should get back, I said reluctantly. The ice made surprisingly little water once it was melted, but it was enough for each of us to slack our thirst. Now that I knew Kate and I were all right again, nothing seemed so bad. Not the ship's violent rocking, not the fact that our treasure hunt had so far brought us next to nothing. As soon as the wind died down, the saga would be back and take us off. And what happened after that, I did not care to think about. Hal set us all to work, searching different areas of the Engineerium. He looked a bit weary and did not seem as big as before. As the room warmed up, everyone was pulling off their hoods and gloves and unbuttoning their skysuits a bit. My toes were starting to thaw. It felt almost balmy. 
I was busy checking through some crates when a hissing sound pulled my gaze to the Arizoan's vivarium. Inside, water was spraying against the glass, running down in rivulets that melted the frost. Kate had noticed it too. Together, we ventured to the door and cautiously pulled it open. We peered inside. The ceiling here was dotted with small sprinklers, now vigorously spinning and sending a dense mist through the chamber. That makes sense, said Kate. Every living thing needs water. He'd have to water them in captivity. The sprinklers turned off. They must have been on some kind of clockwork mechanism. How do you think they got their water in the wild? She asked. Probably rain clouds, I replied. You suppose they froze to death, trapped up here? Kate was shaking her head. Remember those bugs I collected? They weren't frozen. The Arizonans must produce the same kind of anti-freezing chemical. They'd keep getting food through the vents, I said. Kate nodded. But if the sprinklers didn't work, they'd eventually dehydrate and die. It was good to be talking with her like this again, puzzling over things, just like old times. She was so curious and full of wonder. Making sure no one was watching, I took her hand in mine and felt her fingers squeeze back. And I thought home. It took me completely by surprise. But I suppose that once you bid farewell to your first home, you're always looking for another, that place where you can feel happy and strong and at your best. For three years, I'd called the Aurora home. But now that I lived in Paris, it was not the city itself that was home. It was Kate. Grunel's machine gave us light and heat, but it could not make the air any less thin. We've been aboard the Hyperion more than eight hours now, and night was coming on. As the temperature outside plunged, the heater struggled just to keep the Engineerium at freezing. We were all exhausted. A few hours earlier, Kate had asked Hal if she could go to the dead zoo and itemize Grunel's collection. Grudgingly, he'd given her half an hour. I'd accompanied her and held the torch while she hurriedly scribbled details about the creatures in the display cases. Her portable camera, it turned out, was useless in the intense cold. When she tried to take a photograph of the Yeti, the shutter wouldn't even open. Though Kate had complained bitterly that it wasn't nearly enough time, when the half hour was up, we were both shivering violently, and Kate could barely hold her pencil. We'd retreated to the comparative warmth of the Engineerium. Now huddled under the blankets with the others, I noticed that both Kate and Nadira were taking more frequent sips of their tanked air. Hal had not touched his oxygen, nor had I mine. I worry we might run out before we were rescued. We all had dry coughs by now, though Nadira's was the worst. We needed sleep, desperately. I volunteered to take the first two-hour watch. Kate and Nadira put their masks on and slept. Hal slept too, without oxygen coughing and mumbling in his dreams. The sprinklers in the vivarium came on every half hour, melting the frost that was constantly reforming on the glass. I had a clear view of the dead Arizoans drifting listlessly. The storm slackened some, but still the ship moaned and muttered. I was glad for the lights. I wish I'd brought Grunel's diary with me. I would have liked to look at his sketches of the floating city. His giant machine made an ominous creak, and I glanced over at it, still worried it might rip free from its moorings and squish us as we slept. If Hal hadn't bundled away those blueprints so quickly, we might have known how this machine actually worked. I got up to examine its lights and instruments, and listened to the constant burble of water through the pipes. It seemed to be circulating the water to and from the great tank mounted on the wall. The generator gave off heat, too, like the side of a pot-bellied stove. The hydrium smell I'd noticed earlier was stronger now. I didn't think it was coming from the vivarium. Sniffing, I tracked it to the back of Grunel's machine. A thick hose ran from the machine to a vent in the ship's hull. Some water had frozen against the coupling and cracked the rubber. I heard the hiss of escaping gas and put my nose closer. The smell of ripe mangoes wafted over me. 
the fissure was a small one, and I didn't think there was much risk of hydrium filling up the entire room and suffocating us. But there was precious little air as it was, and I wasn't taking any chances. I ferreted around the work tables until I found some sealing tape and wrapped it three times around the crack. The hissing stopped. The smell faded. This machine produced hydrium, I realized in wonder. I'd never heard of such a thing. Hydrium came from deep fissures in the earth and was refined before its use as a lifting gas. Somehow Grunel had figured out a way to make his own. What else this generator of his did, I could not imagine. When I woke Hal later for his watch, I told him about it. I'd be happier if it made gold, he said. Get some sleep. Lying down, I felt the thin air more acutely than before. I was tempted to use some of my tanked oxygen, but wanted to save it for Kate or Nadira if they needed it. It took me quite a while to fall asleep. I dreamed we were all sleeping in the Engineerium and were woken by a dreadful honking sound. It came from the enormous coffin. I was frozen with terror, but Kate and Nadira and Hal seemed calm enough and said someone must be inside. They told me to go and let the poor fellow out. I did not want to go, but without even moving my feet, I found myself upright and skimming over the floor to the coffin. The hongs had become more and more frequent and urgent, like the sounds of a giant, demented goose. I knew what I would find. I heaved up the lid, and there he was again, the same malformed creature I'd seen behind the door. He was half encased in ice, and trying to speak, but his throat and mouth were frozen, and he could not make any words. I wrenched myself from the dream, and woke up with a shout bottled in my throat. Kate was staring at me. You made a very alarming sound, she said. Nightmare? I nodded, not wanting to describe it, for it still hovered with frightening clarity in my mind. I looked over at the coffin, its lid closed. The lights and heaters were still running. The machine blinked and gurgled water. The winds died down, and were rising, I said. A ship's movements had never been a secret to me. I'd always been able to tell when she was climbing, descending, turning, no matter how slight the motion. I hadn't even noticed, said Kate. It's very gentle, I said, not wanting to alarm her. Still, I wondered how long this had been going on. With every hundred feet, the air thinned even more. I looked at Nadira, still asleep under her mask. Her breathing was fast and shallow. Hal told me to turn off her tank at half past three, Kate said. But I didn't have the heart. I nodded, but was calculating how much oxygen we had left. The longer we stayed up high, the more we'd come to rely on tanked air. I couldn't understand why I didn't feel dizzier. I did take longer to do things, every step and effort, but I was still all right. Kate looked very tired, the skin beneath her eyes smirched with purple. How are you feeling? I asked. I wish I knew more chemistry, she said. I had to laugh. That must be very distressing. I'm just trying to figure out how they do it. The Arizoans. I saw she had one of her little notebooks out. At that moment, I felt very fond of them. They seemed almost as much a part of her as her hair or imperious nostrils. Its diet seems so small. A little food, a little water, yet it produces enough energy to keep itself alive. It produces hydrium and also a huge amount of electricity to keep away predators, I suppose. I wonder if it somehow draws energy from the sun. Really, it's a perfect little machine. If she hadn't used the word machine, I probably wouldn't have made the connection. At last, I understood. He got the idea from them, I said, pointing to the Arizona and Grunel had collared with wires. That's why he kept them. He was studying them to find out how they produced so much electricity, and he copied them. What's going on, Hal said, squinting over at us. Matt's having a brainstorm, said Kate. The machine, I said excitedly. I figured out what it does. I expected Hal to turn over and go back to sleep, but he gave a sigh and sat up. He uses the sun. 
He collects the light with that big telescope, just like the Arizoans must collect the sun's energy. Something happens inside there. It's like a giant generator, but it only needs air and water to make an electrical charge. I have no idea how. Then as a byproduct, it makes heat, more water, and hydrium. Hydrium? Kate asked. There's an exhaust pipe at the back that vents hydrium, and the water just keeps going round and round to keep the process going. It's a big battery, Hal said with a shrug. No, not just the battery, I said. It makes power out of nothing. Well, not nothing, just air and water. Well, I'm glad the old fart came up with something useful, said Hal, getting up and stretching. You don't understand, Hal. This is an eternal supply of electricity. Enough to run engines, enough to power tools and generators, and enough extra hydrium to lift a platoon of airships. Or an aerial city, said Kate. Exactly, I said. This machine is Grunel's treasure. But Hal wasn't listening. He was looking over my shoulder. Something moved, he said. We all turned to the vivarium. The four Arizoans dangled limply in the air. They always move a little, I said. Then one of them flinched, and I flinched with it. This was no shifting with the wind. The creature's gauzy apron flared, then contracted sharply, and it jetted higher, its tentacles flexed. Oh my goodness, breathed Kate. They're supposed to be dead, Hal shouted. You told me they were dead. It's the water, Kate said, excited. I don't believe it. It must be anhydrobiosis. What are you talking about? I demanded. Some creatures put themselves into hibernation when there's not enough water. I read about this. It's called anhydrobiosis. And then when there's ample water, they revivify. But this is remarkable. Usually it only happens with very small primitive organisms. Then let's stop watering them, Hal said. They're not machines, Kate told him. You can't just turn them off. I ran to the glass door to make sure it was securely shut. It was. The Arizoan was now jetting about the vivarium like an airborne squid. It nudged one of the others, and seconds later, that one jerked to life too. This is fascinating, Kate said. Suddenly, the third Arizoan jerked to life. Only one didn't stir. The one harnessed by Grunel. The other three circled around it. The biggest flew in close, squatted against it, and ripped away some of its withered flesh with its beak. The other two Arizoans closed in as well and started feeding. There was a great deal of fighting between them as they jockeyed for space, lashing out at one another with their tentacles. After being so long in hibernation, they're bound to be voraciously hungry, explained Kate. I could have done without the voracious bit, I said. What's going on? Nadira asked, sitting up, only half awake. Kate's pets have woken up, Hal said, taking out his pistol. But not for long. Put that away, Kate said. They're safely behind glass. Don't do it, Hal, I said. Shatter the glass, and we'll have all of them out in the open. Save your bullets. Reluctantly, he holstered his gun. Nadira watched the Arizoans with a mixture of fascination and horror. Kate was entranced. In a matter of minutes, they had stripped the dead one, leaving only its balloon sack. Then they pierced that with their beaks, tearing it to shreds as it sagged slowly to the floor. Even with a glass wall between us, I felt sickened being so close to them. Their feeding noises were muted. A rapid clicking of their beaks, the rustle and slap of membranes and tentacles jostling. Have any of you seen the floating eggs? Kate asked. Likely they got eaten, I said dully. The Arizoans seemed to be sated, for they had stopped foraging for the vivarium floor and drifted up to the ceiling. Their balloon sacks, I noticed, were fuller, as though they'd already produced more hydrium for themselves. I wouldn't have noticed the break in the glass if an Arizoan hadn't drifted right past it. Up there! I blurted in alarm, pointing. There's a hole! It was small and jagged, no bigger than a billiard ball. The Arizoans were too big to fit through, but the glass around it was cracked and weakened by ice. And I knew the power of the creature's tentacles. 
I ran to get the sealing tape. The maintenance scaffolding that ran around Gruno's telescope was almost flush with the vivarium wall, and I figured I could reach the hole from there. I started up the spiral stairs. I'm going to patch it, I said. I reached the scaffolding, puffing hard. As I leaned out over the railing toward the glass, the Aerozoans did not move. But I noticed that their tentacles drew up a little closer toward their bodies, as if tensed. I tore off a strip of tape with my teeth and leaned way over to patch the hole. Matt, watch out! From the floor, Nadira was pointing at something behind me. I whirled, instinctively dropping to a crouch. Above me was a small, translucent shimmer. A tiny Arizoan. It didn't seem to have any dark designs on me, for it was bobbing away, gossamer apron flapping, tentacles waggling like a baby's chubby fingers. It was no bigger than a small jellyfish, but I didn't care how harmless it looked. I wanted it far away. It must have hatched, Kate called up, and found its way out through the hole. How many eggs had there been? I tried to remember. They were all in a cluster. Eight or nine, maybe? Cautiously, I scanned the room, wondering if any others had hatched and escaped. Near the top of the telescope, I saw the glimmer of balloon sacks and tentacles. There are three more, I yelled. Taking my piece of tape, I leaned out to seal the hole in the vivarium. A gust of warm mango hit me in the face, and a split second later, a tentacle lashed out against the vivarium's wall, inches from my face. I heard a crack and recoiled. An Arizoan billowed against the glass, tentacles writhing. Get down from there, Cruz! shouted Hal. You're just making it angry! The glass now bore a network of hairline cracks. The tentacle struck again. This time, glass splintered and the hole doubled in size. The creature's tentacle shot clear through, getting slashed against the sharp edges. It pulled back, but the tip remained in the hole, delicately tapping the edges as if mapping it. Matt! Kate called. I really think you ought to come down! I couldn't have agreed more. I backed toward the stairs, for I wanted to keep my eye on the big one in the vivarium. To my relief, it seemed to lose interest in me and sailed away. Then it stopped. It turned. It jetted straight for the glass, stretching itself as long and skinny as a spear. I cursed under my breath and started running. The Arizona gave one last great contraction of its apron and tentacles, compressed itself into a tight bundle, and soared clean through the hole, over my head, and into the engineerium. Everyone out! Hal was shouting. Get to the door! I hurtled off the spiral stairs and rushed to join the retreat. We took nothing, just ran for the catwalk. Hal had his pistol at the ready and was trying to take aim. The Arizona swelled back to its normal size and jetted up to the ceiling among the cables and pulleys. For a second, I lost sight of it. Then it moved, and I saw its dangling tentacles sweeping toward us fast. Out! Out! Hal shouted, wielding his pistol. Don't shoot! I yelled. You'll pierce the gas cells! Hal took a shot anyway, and missed the bullet whistling through the ship's innards. I rushed Nadira and Kate ahead of me through the doorway, and then turned to see where Hal was. He was intent on taking another shot. One of the Arizona's tentacles hit a circular saw, and the electric current brought it briefly to life, sparks flying off its metal surface. Hal, come on! I ran back to grab him and haul him out of the room, yanking the door shut behind us. It slid into place with a well-oiled hiss, and we were plunged into total darkness. The cold came upon us like a hammer's blow. Only Nadira had had the presence of mind to snatch up a torch. We stood there in the pale light, shaking and panting, numbly pulling up our hoods and fastening buttons. We still had our sky suits, but in our panic to flee, we'd left behind our rucksacks, our gloves, and all the oxygen tanks. No one needed to mention any of this. We were all thinking it. We knew we could not go back inside. Kate slipped her hand into mine. I squeezed back. It's all right, I said. It's nearly dawn. The saga should be coming for us soon. At first light, we'll be back aboard, Hal said. A couple hours at most. The wind's lost all her puff. Let's go to Grinnell's apartment and get as warm as we can, I said, my teeth starting to chatter. Kate did not object this time. 
after the Arizoans, our phantom fear seemed far less threatening. Good idea, said Hal. There are windows. We'll have some light soon. Wearily, we made our way forward. My nostrils cracked with the cold. My face felt brittle as china. I pulled my hands up inside my sleeves, hoping to ease the icy pain that coursed through them. The windows in Grunel's quarters let in some star and moonlight, and also the glow along the eastern horizon. We did not venture into the bedroom, but settled in the starboard lounge. I fetched all of the remaining blankets from the linen cupboard. Hal draped a huge rug over the furniture and made a kind of tent for us, insulated with cushions. We huddled together trying to keep the cold at bay. We were all too dispirited to speak. Even Hal seemed completely exhausted. My heart beat faster than usual, strained but undefeated by the meager air. I did not know if we actually slept or merely all lapsed into a kind of semi-conscious stupor. I was aware of everyone's labored breathing. I was aware of the cold gripping my face and feet and hands. And yet, I could not keep the image of Grunel's machine from my mind. Hal hadn't understood how important it was. If only we had the blueprints. Where had Hal sent them? Half awake, I slid out from my blankets and made my way to Grunel's bedroom. The door was closed. I opened it. Inside, I could make out only shadows. I saw the dark form of Theodore Grunel hunched over in his chaise lounge. I went to the message tubes. Beneath the outgoing tube was a little row of buttons with the names of all the rooms where you could send messages. I found the button that was still pressed in. Anger and disappointment gripped me. Of all the places Hal could have sent the blueprints, he had sent them straight to the Engineerium.